Spencer Ware, we had God. different opinions. Spencer let's Ware. just bring. We're, we're gonna go full. Let's tilt. just bring up Ware. All right, let's get into let's it. Let's bring up Ware before we, you know, go into a cell. <laughs> well, if we're talking about a cell, I mean, you could technically sell Spencer Ware. That wouldn't be my recommendation. But if you watched our Where is Jamal, I believe was the title of that video. Yeah, it was a good last title. Last week, we had a uh, pretty heated debate about Spencer Ware and Charkandrick West. Now, I'm not going to completely throw you under the bus. Your argument wasn't that West was going to come in and perform. It was that it was going to be more of a split backfield, mm -hmm. which if you look at snap percentage, it was. It was an exact split, yeah. It was an exact split. Uh, but if you watch the game with two eyes... <laughs> And you saw a dominant performance and a very underwhelming performance. Mm. The dominant performance mm. coming from Spencer Ware, who mm. totaled 199 yards, mm. put the team on his back. Okay, let's get let's let's talk about Open. that. Um, so I I did watch this game. I watched this game very closely because I needed to know if I was wrong about Spencer Ware, and because I'm a Jamal did Charles owner. Uh, and I will say that I was wrong, based solely okay. off of the fourth quarter, because in the first three quarters. It was a split. It started off with where is the start, uh, and then the Chiefs fell behind very quickly. And then for the second and third quarter, it was mostly West, which is how it ended up even, because then they were they were trying to throw to catch up. Lots of checks down to West that ended up just going nowhere because he apparently is, I'm going to assume, just not in game shape after missing all of preseason. Um, he didn't look very good. No, he didn't look good at all. Um, <laughs> and so then they said, okay, uh, let's, let's go back. Let's go back to where, see if this works. And then it worked very well, uh, and that's when he yeah. exploded and it, you know, went his way. Um, but yeah, the snaps were even, the targets were almost even. Ware had eight targets, West had six, but all of Ware's targets came in the fourth quarter. Um, so the way I see it, there's two ways to view what happened. One of it is um, they tried to have it be a committee, but they were losing so bad, they say, we just got to go with the hot hand, and it was Ware, and it worked. Um, but their, their MO is still... A committee that's still what they want to do you know where pops up on the injury report you know maybe they don't want to God, ride I, i'm not saying this is what i believe <laughs> i'm saying this is one version of it um and so maybe they they want to keep them healthy because they don't know how long they're going to need these guys until charles and so it ends up a split and this time against a much tougher run defense because all everything signals that the chargers run defense is awful they were awful last year so it's not a leap to say they're awful this year um that maybe he doesn't have as much running room, and then it ends up a split again, and instead of Rawls dropping 25 points, they each drop 10, and then it's not quite the blow-up game. Uh, that is something that could happen. I just I want to throw out that as a possibility. Um, I, I will say that I think it's... What you have to do, though, because af after what he did, is treat it as the fourth quarter is indicative of what's going to happen. They figured out, okay, where it can be used as a pass catcher, he can be our guy, uh, let's try that. You know, let's let's keep that rolling into the next game. So I think he will be given the chance to do that at the start of this game. I think the first quarter is all wear, and then as long as he doesn't struggle, it will continue to be wear the rest of the game. So yeah, I, as I long can, as he, yeah. he as long as he doesn't show signs of uh, wear and tear, wear and you tear. Will. I mean, yeah, I, you definitely if you're a wear only you have to pay attention to the practice reports and the injury report and make sure that what cropped up today was just a maintenance day and not you it's, know. And not actually something that's wrong. Cramped toe? What was it? A sprained toe. Um, he which, stubbed his toe in the locker that's, room. That's that what everyone. What yeah, that was the Twitter thing. <laughs> like, oh, he stubbed his toe. But it wouldn't be the first time we saw that. Like, someone pops up on the injury report Wednesday. Nah, it's not a big deal. And then it kind of lingers till Friday. Then all of a sudden they're questionable. Then all of a sudden they're like not part of the game plan. That's happened several times before. So just like keep an eye on what happens with Ware. But the thing is, if you own him, you kind of have to start him. So he's yeah. you're starting him. You know. Yeah, I mean, my take, I watched the game as well very closely because of our debate last <laughs> week. Debate. And and this was happening the same time that the Raider game was happening. So, yeah. I mean, I had the game split screened. That's how <laughs> invested I was into Spencer Ware this week. And this is what I saw from Spencer oh, Ware. God. I saw the very first drive of the game. Spencer Ware was out there every down. Mm. He, and they drove mm. down. They scored first. They had the field goal. And on that drive, not only was he the first and second down back, but he was the third down back. He ended up catching like a... 30 or 40 yard pass on the first drive he of the game, which basically set them up for the field goal. And then they imploded. Yeah. All of a sudden, San Diego was up by three touchdowns. And then you're right. We did see a lot of West. And I think 
I mean, you had your conversation in the Seattle locker room when they're like, oh, shit, dude, let's just put out rolls in the third quarter. You have the insider access. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I was in the KC, if I was on the KC sideline, it was probably like, well, you know, Wes was our uh, pass down uh, back last year. Let's, let's just put him in now. And, and we're behind by three touchdowns. We have nothing to lose. Yeah. And it didn't work, basically. Yeah. I mean, he, he where was essentially game scripted out, but. Even so, he was being sprinkled back in. It mm -hmm. was like they were trying to get West going, and then did, nothing happened. It didn't happen, yeah. And then by the time you got to the fourth quarter, they were like, okay, look, we've realized that not only is where our early down back or the back we're going to pound if we're ahead, but at this point it's looking like he's the back we need to play regardless of the score. So they just abandoned West, and they said, okay, we're done with you. We're, we're tired of these screens getting blown up in the backfield. And nothing is happening. I mean, West had like two yards per touch, was his about his yeah, average. He was, through the he, he was awful. That that's kind of what bailed out. Where was that? West was so bad that they said, "Nope, we gotta we gotta try out Ware as our every down back." And then he did it very well. Yeah, he did it very well. Very well. <laughs> um, well, then uh, I, I guess the part that we should like address then is like. Um, so let's say Charles comes back. Probably not this week, but next week. What do you think happens? What do you think is the most likely scenario with, with Ware now that he's exploded like a diaper? I think I'm completely sold at this point in my mind hmm. that at least for the first couple of weeks that Jamal sees the field, he will not be an every down back. Hmm. I think the chances of that happening are very, very slim at this point. I mean, all the news surrounding Jamal is incredibly murky. I mean, he's been like the side participant at practice uh, since like week three of the preseason or something. Uh, it doesn't seem like he's progressing very quickly from this second torn ACL. And we don't really know what's going on with Jamal. We only have these vague practice reports from their beat writers saying that it looks like Jamal will miss another week. We have no idea if it's because he just looks a little bit slow or if, you know, there's real concern with his health still. Yeah. Like maybe he just is not the same running back. You know, it, we don't know if it's like, okay, he's recovering a bit slowly, but he'll be fine. Or if it's, okay, shh, well, he's not the same guy. And that's the reason why they're trying to feature wear more. We really don't know. And because of that, you have to hold wear, in my opinion, even though he blew up and he's a prime candidate for, okay, sell him after his 25 point performance. I think you have to hold him because of what's going on with Jamal and that even if Jamal comes back, it's looking like he won't come back this week. Mm -hmm. But if he comes back in week three, I think we're looking at a split. In his first game back, his first live action of the season, I don't think he'll be the feature back. I think it will be a split. And I think it will be that way for a couple of weeks. They'll evaluate Jamal like, okay, if Jamal Charles is Jamal Charles, then he'll take over. But they need to see it happen at this point. So I think where is a hold because... Right now, the percentage is climbing higher and higher that he will be involved the rest of the season because the narrative before week one was that, okay, he's basically Giangelo Williams. He's like the trophy holder until Jamal comes back. Mm -hmm. I don't know anymore, guys. I don't know with Jamal right now. I'm a little bit worried about Jamal Charles. I don't own Jamal, so it really it doesn't matter to me. But I think if you own Jamal, I would be a bit concerned that even when he does come back, that he's going to be part of a committee. No, no, that's a, that's a very fair and reasonable take, as 100% wrong as it is. Uh, no, okay. I, that's, that's like, your take. I, I think you're definitely right that he's going to be eased back in. It seems like at the soonest it's next week, so it could be you know week five before we're seeing like full speed Jamal, um, and you know we don't know age 30, two major knee injuries, all those arguments, like, is he the same guy? Who knows? Um, obviously, if he's not the same guy, then that opens up. It's probably a committee. Um, but even if he is the same guy, I found, like, an interesting sort of stat when I did some data mining to figure out, you know, what has Jamal been in the past? And he's actually never had more than 60% of the carries in any of the Kansas City offense and never had okay. more than 12% um, of the target share. Or even of the of like the pass catching target share, he still hasn't even had like he has the majority of it, but he doesn't have like sixty percent of it. He has like thirty percent of it. Um, so he's kind of always been a you know smaller workload committee back. It's just that he is a home run hitter, so it's worked out. Um, 
so even super efficient he's yeah he's so efficient it doesn't matter um you know yeah. in in 2014 he had 200 carries to Nile Davis's 130 uh in 2013 he had where is it I had it right he had 250 carries to Nile Davis's 80 um and so he's just kind of always been one of these he's not a 300 carry back he's not he's not really actually a workhorse back he's always been a a 60% pass catching back who has like a guy that compliments him and so i think that will be where you know unless west somehow comes out and no it's going to be where um it'll be like we're complimenting him so i think there's a role where if charles is himself he's the 60 percent guy he's getting a majority of the pass catching stuff but we see you know where sprinkled in here and there um and there's you know i he's probably not drb1 i think that's probably not in question even though he did that one of the years he had one of these small workloads but NRB1, I think, is still very much possible because that's that's what he's always done when he's had this kind of workload. Yeah. Uh, what I would watch when Jamal comes back is how he's used in the red zone. Yeah. Because Ware was inc- incredibly efficient last year in the red zone. Tip, uh, basically, I think it was inside the 10. He had seven carries and scored on five of them, or inside the five. So basically mm-hmm. goal line work, if you're talking about goal line running backs and in week one against the chargers he scored a five-yard touchdown again and the thing with Ware is that i mean he just has a motor that doesn't stop i mean he he got hit a couple yards out and just willed his way into the end zone and that's kind of his mo is he's just Mm -hmm. bruiser uh he might offer more power wise now i do think jamal charles is a bit underrated in that power running yeah uh mold but I think Ware can offer a little bit more bang. So you might be looking at more of a split than you want. Uh, it's definitely something to monitor because right now with the way the news is playing out, really nobody knows what's yeah. going on with Jamal. Nobody knows. Uh, we'll see how he's utilized when he comes back. And at this point, it's a question mark because, I mean, up until that last week of the preseason, it was, oh, Jamal's penciled in for week one. Didn't happen. Jamal's probably going to play week two. Might not happen. Week three, I mean, we want to assume that he's going to come back, but who's to say that, I mean, he just isn't the same running back, Yeah. which is kind of scary if you drafted him super early and you don't have a contingency plan behind him. Like, if you're a Jamal owner and you're thin at running back and you don't have Spencer Ware, then you're probably panicking right now. Yeah. But if you have the depth, you're, you're probably okay. You can sit Jamal and not really worry about it. Uh, the question is, if you do own Jamal and you don't own Ware, what are you willing to spend to get Spencer Ware at this point? Yeah, that's a that's a tough thing to decide because I'm in that scenario in one league. Um, but I also don't desperately need Ware because I have him pretty deep at running back in that league. Um, but I, th- I think I'd be willing to treat him as like a like an RB3. Th- RB3, like I wouldn't want, you don't want to sell the farm on this guy if you're a Jamal owner because he's a fill-in for one, maybe two more weeks, uh, and then he'll be splitting it with Jamal, and then there's a chance, you know, if you own both and Jamal is himself, you are starting Jamal over Spencer Ware, and so he will go to your bench. And so you're trading for a guy that is a fill-in for a couple weeks and is a contingency plan in case Jamal Charles is a shell of himself, which... At this point, is a well justifiable. It's a fear, you know. There's no been there's yeah. been no reports about that. There's nothing to suggest that other than that he's taking a while coming back. But for all we know, he comes back and he's 100 percent himself. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he comes back and he's done. He comes back and he's himself. And the reason it took so long is they're like, oh, we have this backup running back and where who is so good that we can take our time with Jamal and we don't have to rush him back. It's it's very much could be that too. So yeah, I mean that completely makes sense as well. I mean. Yeah. What probably happened realistically is that they looked at how good Ware was in the preseason and they looked at Jamal and said, we have this luxury Mm -hmm. that we can wait to make sure that he is 100% when he comes back. And if that's the case, then, yeah, Ware is completely expendable because when Jamal comes back, if that's what they're doing, then, uh, I mean, he's not completely expendable. He he basically becomes D'Angelo Williams, where... Okay, if Jamal goes down, then he's like this elite tier handcuff where he'll step into that workhorse role. But he's a wait and see right now. You can't really 
unless you're getting an insane package for Spencer Ware, like the Jamal owner is fully panic room, case two, Jody Fofo action, <laughs> he's offering like, you know, a package that blows you out of the water, you know, maybe like a Doug Barton or something like that. Whew, what I a, mean, what a hateful package to offer for Spencer <laughs> Ware. <laughs> but I mean, you, you, we've seen these proposals on Twitter. I oh, mean, yeah. this, this always happens after week one where you get these overreactions like, oh, man, I just had to trade Brandon Marshall for Willie Sneed. Jeez, uh, yeah, so you could potentially see a package for like, okay, well, Ware got 25 points. Doug Martin didn't really perform. I mean, he didn't hit 10 points, so I'm going to go ahead and offer Doug Martin for Spencer Ware. And if you're the Ware owner at the point, I mean, you're, whoo, you're happy. You're uh, screaming from the rooftops with that type of value for Spencer Ware. Yeah, I think uh, if as a Jamal owner, um, I would be willing, if I was going to part with another running back to get Ware, it would be like a TJ Yeldon, Amir Abdullah, um, Isaiah Crowell. It would be someone in that vein, you know, someone who has upside but um, isn't this like, you know, not a high-end running back because, you know, again, he's he's a fill-in for you. Um, I, I would do what I... Did actually, I would do what I did, uh, which is to use other pieces of your team to try and upgrade the rest of your running backs so that Jamal is more of a luxury than something that like you need right now. You don't want to, if you're trading because you are like desperately in need of something, that's a bad situation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if the other owner is smart too, they'll realize that you're desperate, Mm -hmm. which I, that's a luxury you have as a wear owner. If the Jamal owner comes knocking on your door, you are in complete control of the narrative. Yeah. Right? If they're simply not offering you enough, you just hold on to where because you have no reason to trade them for essentially somebody who's just going to go to your bench and not have that same bench appeal that Ware has. Yeah. You will legitimately need to get a starter in return for Spencer Ware to make it, you know, viable to trade him at this point. But it's like D'Angelo Williams. I mean, he came in, he tore up week one. Spencer Ware is basically D'Angelo Williams right now. Yeah, I'd say that's fair. But I think he has a potential to be more because we don't know what's happening with Jamal. With D'Angelo, you know that Lev Bell's coming back in week four. You know that he will step right back into that workhorse role and that D'Angelo Williams will be relegated to the bench again as that high-end handcuff. We don't know if that's the case with Ware. Mm -hmm. Ware might earn more of a split or he might, dare I say, just steal the job. I mean, that that could happen if Jamal is, like, a complete shell of himself. Yeah. If he goes full, like, Michael Turner and he's just, like, a completely different player. 